episode of the Amazon Files brought to you by Mommy Income. I am your host, Kristen Ostrander, and we are back talking about trademarks and brand registry for your Amazon store. Why are we talking about this again? Because it's really important, and Amazon's changed some rules yet again about brand registry. They're letting you uh, register your trademark, um, your, your brand, when your trademark is just filed. So before, they were waiting until you got your um, serial number and you were officially trademarked and ready. But now, if you only just submit your trademark application, you can register your brand. So today we are back talking to our uh, mommy income resident uh, attorney, Ben Becker, who is going to be with us again today to give us a little bit of do's and don'ts and helpful tricks and tips to be able to get your trademark filed in order to get brand registry. But first, I want to make sure you guys remember that this is one of the last opportunities for you to sign up for our live in-person Confident Wholesale Bundlers Workshop. I am already excited to meet oh, most of you that are coming. There's a few spots left. I would love to see more of you come in person. I want to walk you through the trade show, go through the framework, help you to literally build a bundle from start to finish with your group. And you will leave with so many ideas, so many new friends, and just really fired up to finish the year strong and then start next year strong doing wholesale bundling. So mommyincome.com slash workshop. Don't forget there's a special coupon code, uh, workshop50 for all of you podcast listeners to save a few dollars. I can't wait to meet you in person. And actually, you know, if you're okay with it, give you a hug and see people in person. So please, uh, mommyincome.com slash workshop. Uh, let's do all this together because Q4 is coming and that's the biggest selling season season of the year. So now let's get right to it. Let's get to talking to Ben. So Ben, welcome back to the show. I'm so glad you're here again to help us and inform us and teach us more about the trademarking process for our Amazon stores and just for it in general. So welcome back. Thank you. I'm happy to be back and, and really been a pleasure working with you before and I'm looking forward to doing it again. Awesome. Yeah, I know. Of course, I've been working with you now this time, filing a couple more trademarks and kind of uh -huh. moving things forward. And I really wanted to share what was new um, with um, not only what you're doing new, but also what Amazon is doing new with trademarking and how they're making it for once a little bit easier for us to get our foot in the door once we have a trademark. Mm -hmm. So um, I know uh, just as an update, Amazon has now allowed us to, um, once you register for your trademark, even if it's not approved, they let you use that registration number to file for brand registry. So um, as people are going through the long drawn out process of you know the government entities we deal with, um, mm -hmm. they're able to start protecting their accounts with uh, their trademark and brand registry. So that's something that's up and coming and new. Um, but tell us a little bit about what's new for you. Thank you. Uh, so I, for, since the last time I came on here, I have actually recently moved over to a new law firm. Uh, my former law firm was my personal one, Royal Trademark Law Services. And I have since joined the firm Pulse IP, which is a subsidiary of LegalZoom. So if you go to LegalZoom and you work with them through the attorney-led trademark process, you now have the opportunity to work with me and my, uh, my fantastic colleagues there at Pulse IP. So I did want to let everybody know about that. I have had people reach out via my um, my Royal Trademark Law email, and I will st kill, still keep that active for uh, a, another year or so, but um, I will be redirecting people to Pulse. Just uh, wanted to let everybody know about that and uh, give you kind of a heads up on, on where things sit for me right now. Perfect. Yeah. And all the links will be in the show notes as well. So if you guys are listening to this or watching this on YouTube, all the links to get a hold of Ben and his team um, will be available there. And of course, you sign up like I went through the process myself, you guys. I don't just like bring people on and tell you guys what to do. I've done it myself now like several times. I'm working on my third trademark at this moment. So um, with that, filed with uh, Ben and his team, of course, they're trustworthy, awesome and make it so simple. I loved the new process of Good. basically here's your application all you have to do is sign here and send it back and there's not a whole lot of 
hoopla going on. You know, we have that intake um, moment. So, um, so let's talk about just the importance again, for those that maybe haven't heard the other episode or just kind of recapping, cause we all need to hear this a couple of times, right? Um, mm-hmm. When it comes to trademarking, um, why is this such an important thing, even for what people would consider this side hustle Amazon thing that they're doing? It might not be like, hey, my stuff's not going to Walmart. Who cares if it's trademarked? Why is this so important? Great question. And um, aside from the obvious, uh, you need a trademark in order to participate in brand registry. Um, a trademark, the purpose of a trademark is to protect your brand, to help you grow and develop your, your brand, your goodwill and allow clients to identify you as the, as the source of a product or a service. Um, so really, if you think about a business, uh, their reputation is more important than the products that they're making. Because if people don't trust the business themselves, they're not gonna purchase the product no, how, no matter what quality it is. Um, so really, when you're developing your personal brand for your products, your Amazon store, whatever it may be, you're really protecting kind of the most valuable asset for your company. So taking the extra time, and it is quite a bit of time, as you alluded to with with the process, uh, spending the extra money to really ensure that you have locked yourself in and are protecting yourself is is kind of pivotal to both your brand growth. And then, you know, most people aren't going to do the same thing until they die. They, they will likely think about selling the brand and then the, the business at some point. And uh, as you are aware, having a trademark be owned by your business makes your business that much more valuable to uh, prospective purchasers. So there are a couple of different reasons where, um, you know, getting, getting the trademark registered with the USPTO is really your best bet. And uh, the reason I say registered with the USPTO is that if you register your trademark with the US Patent and Trademark Office, then you have protection for the entirety of the United States, no matter, no matter whether or not you sell in every single state. If you do not register with the United States Patent and Trademark Office, you only have protection within the market in which you are currently selling your products or services. So it is important to, again, take that extra step, get the trademark registered and really uh, help you and your customers grow your business and your brand. Yes, I love how you said that too, because it's so true. We talk about that. Like I am constantly preaching the gospel of business assets and how you build your business for long-term you know, sustainability or exit. You know, A lot of people think, oh, this is a little side hustle. Oh, I don't feel like doing it anymore. And then they just like, close down and move on. But what they don't realize is that no matter what stage they're at in the business, if they've been in business a couple of years or they've had some revenue, they can sell that business maybe even for 20 grand. It doesn't have to be, you know, six, seven figures, but I think people yeah. don't realize the value of that, that this is something, it's an investment that's going to pay dividends eventually. So it's something that's not just throw, it's not like rent money where you're just kind of like, oh, well, we have to pay the rent, but it's actually helping you build an asset that somebody else might acquire. And that's, you know, I have two working on the third now, and I understand how important that is, but I also know it's not always cheap, but you know what, when we're in business to build assets, cheap is not in my vocabulary. (laughs) (laughs) I want it done. I want it done right. So, um, needing, needing a trademark, um, for Amazon versus, you know, other places and other things when people are actually building brands, just had this conversation, uh, with my mom, business partner about, um, our new product that, that, you know, it's not quite in the market yet. I mean, it's in the market, but barely, um, but, you know, thinking about that and thinking about the protection of that, that we filed that ahead of time so that the day we did go to market, we don't have any, you know, people competing and trying to steal our name and things. Indeed, it's kind of hard yeah. work people are doing to even create bundle brands on Amazon. And I think that um, that protection is just worth the extra. It's like insurance almost, um, except for yeah. you have it for five years. <laughs> yep. And, and then another reason, and I, I didn't throw this in there initially, but I should have, um, you spend a lot of time, money, effort, energy, building your brand. And if you don't get trademark protection, there is a chance that somebody could get trademark protection for that same brand and then either prevent you from continuing to offer those products or services or significantly limit the market that you have available to do so. So you don't want to put in the time, you don't want to put in the effort, the energy, only to find out that 
somebody else did copy your brand and get it registered. And now you're looking at a rebrand and kind of having to start building that, that um, consumer confidence all over again. Yeah. Before this episode, I had some, uh, I had uh, our listeners submit some questions that they had about this um, because podcasts aren't live, of course. So they're like, okay, I said, submit all of your questions. And one, somebody had a really great, great question that I couldn't answer. And I'm hoping that you can, or maybe it's just so we'll get back to you. <laughs> um, but their question was, as we're doing wholesale bundling, which I know that you've been familiar with, um, when as far as our, our business model and what I'm teaching people is, how is it legal for you to trademark a brand that then also incorporates other brands? So we make gift sets and you've got, you know, so if you're making a chocolate lover's gift set, as an example, you've got Hershey and Ghirardelli and Dove chocolate bars within the Kristen's favorite things, chocolate gift set. So how is that legal if you're trademarking a brand that it incorporates other brands or is it legal? It, it is because you are you are making a new product uh, that does not exist in the market and you are using those brands in what they call fair market or fair fair uh, fair market use so um, if you are talking about a Nike product I can use the name Nike all I want if I am a, a retailer I can use the Nike trademark to tell people I sell Nike products because that's what it is. That's who the source of the product or the service is. Now, if I took a Nike shirt and I put, you know, Ben's apparel across the top of it and then tried to pass it off as my own product, that's when you get into trouble because that is me taking somebody else's product and trying to identify myself as the source of that product. That's not what these people are doing. The people who are creating bundles are creating an entirely new product out of third party products and then advertising them as they are uh, legally able to do and accurately describing what's in those packages. So you have fair use, you, you can continue to use other trademarks to identify the trademarks, to talk about their products or their services. And uh, nobody would be able to come after you for doing so because it is, uh, it, you know, it's the accurate and correct way to describe the source of that particular item. Awesome. Thank you for that clarity, because I think mm -hmm. that's just got a lot of people, um, you know, we've got everyone from like high risk takers to people that are like literally follow the letter of every law. And someone's like, well, I want to follow my trademark and here's the name, but I'm going to be using XYZ brands within my brand. How is it like, am I going to get sued? Am I going to get, you know, so people are very nervous about that. Yeah. So for that, don't don't call it the Nike bundle, because <laughs> that in, that implies that it's uh, uh, somehow affiliated with Nike, uh, you know, call it, call it the, the Kristen bundle of Nike products, because that way it's the Kristen bundle. And then in your descriptions, you're just talking about all these wonderful products from Nike that you have. Right, right. Perfect. Well, thanks for the clarity of that. Okay. So when it comes to trademarking, of course, this is one of the questions we get all the time. Well, should I do it myself? Do I really need an attorney? What, what, what does this really entail? And I know I've t taught an entire training about how to at least read the application, pick the classes, all that kind of stuff. But then I've also done it myself and used you. So I, I have my own personal things or when I run into problems, I freak out and go, no, thanks. <laughs> I need professional help. Um, my first time around, everything went completely smoothly it was such a bizarre kind of a trademark that i filed anyway so there was no competition no searches nothing to conflict it and that seemed really cut and dry easy but then when i went to the second time it was not so easy so talk a little bit about um what people need to know if they attempt to do it on their own versus how you guys assist certainly um, so obviously my answer to whether or not an attorney should help you is it depends. Um, for those of you who are, are more comfortable with a, a greater level of risk, uh, obviously it might be more, uh, more for you to more, more palatable for you to try it yourself. Um, you definitely can do it yourself. You can go ahead as, as long as you are a U.S. resident, I will put a caveat in there. Uh, if you live outside the United States, you do have to have a U.S. attorney file for you. But for everybody else who lives in the U.S., you can create an account with the USPTO. You can go in, you click file the application, you fill out the information, your name, the owner, the contact information, the trademark, and then you provide certain types of information that's required. 
Um, for those of you who are not using your mark to sell in commerce, basically you provide the mark and then you pay your fees and you hit submit and you hope all goes well. Um, for those of you who want a little bit more assurance, um, then you could work with us and we will do a couple different things. One, we'll make sure that you provided all the correct information on the application. Two, we'll make sure we will do what they call a, a clearance search for your trademark, which means we will look at every trademark within the USPTO's database, both registered marks and pending applications. We'll look at social media, general web page, business names, all of those things. And we will look for any marks which could be determined to be similar to your mark and that are offering the same or related products or services because when the USPTO looks at a trademark, they look for a couple of different things. One of them being, is this mark too similar to any existing marks? The reason for that is they don't want consumers to be confused about the source of a product or service. That's why you can't claim your product is the Nike bundle. They don't want people thinking that's coming from Nike. That's why you don't see a coffee store called Starbucks with a Z because they don't want to think that's an offshoot from Starbucks. So if your mark is similar to any existing mark, they will refuse your application and you will not be able to get registered unless you can somehow convince the examiner that they were wrong. You got about a 50% chance if you're doing that really well. Uh, the majority of people, it's significantly lower um, success rate. Okay, so, fair um, enough. <laughs> doing, the, doing the search yourself is good if you can understand what you're looking at and you have an understanding of how to view certain marks. And the way I say that is this. So um, for example, if you were to file a trademark for, uh, so it will take my trademark, uh, Royal Trademark Law Services. If there was uh, another trademark already called um, trademark, Ro trademark Royal Services or Royale Trademark Services, either one of those would qualify, <clears throat> excuse me, as a likelihood of confusion. And if you're not uh, paying attention to that, or if you're not used to looking at, at the search reports in those ways, you might miss it and therefore spend all that time and money and only have to start the process all over again. Um, another thing that uh, is good for working with an attorney is that when the USPTO looks at your mark, one of the most important things is, does your mark function as a trademark? And what I mean when I say that is, does it allow a consumer to look at your product and re readily and easily identify you as the source of a product? So you can't be using uh, a trademark for shoes, a trademark called Ben Shoes for shoes, because I'm just describing the product and nobody knows who is who is the source of that product. Um, is that is that you know Joe Schmo around the corner or is it? Uh, you know, Adidas or something like that, an offshoot of them. So uh, if you're developing your own trademark and you're doing it yourself, there are a couple of things that you need to keep in mind. Um, some kind of, kind of best practices. One, try not to just describe your product. Uh, if, if you call it a blue shoe and you're selling blue shoes, the USBTO is going to say that's merely descriptive of the product and it doesn't function as a trademark. It doesn't tell people the source of the product or service. Uh, two, try not to use your last name in, in combination with any descriptive words. So Ben's blue sh or uh, Becker's blue shoes. It, it could get registered and it, it has uh, the, the ability to be registered. It's just going to run into a couple of hurdles and it's not the strongest trademark out there because there are any number of people who have the last name Becker. So it's harder for customers to understand that I, Benjamin Becker, am the sole source of that product or service. Okay. Fair another yeah. another thing to take into consideration is that you don't want to use a term that is a term of art. So, uh, for example, podcasts is a, is a term of art to describe the type of service or product that people are creating. So you can't have a product just called podcast if it's representing you making podcasts. Now, if I took podcast and applied it to gardening tools, well, that has no connection to gardening tools. So that would be a good mark 
because a customer wouldn't readily look at podcast on my gardening tools and think of downloadable uh, recordings that they can listen to on their phone or, or computers. So uh, when you're looking at a mark, you want to try to stay away from descriptive terms. Try to stay away from your own last name plus descriptive terms. You also want to avoid being confusingly similar, like I talked about earlier, to any registered mark. So don't take a unknown uh, competitor and misspell the name. Or uh, if they have two terms, uh, switch the, the order of the terms of the words. Both of those will get you into a likelihood of confusion issue. Uh, you, it also, if you think about it this way, if you're trying to be similar to uh, a consumer or a competitor, pardon me, you're not building your own unique brand. You're kind of trying to ride the coattails of that, that competitor and therefore really tying yourself to them in such a way that if they screw up, you're going to see some backlash too because customers might be confused about which one of you uh, is the less reputable brand. That's really cool. You know, the one of the examples I saw of that when you were talking about something that's so like the gardening tools and, and the podcast, uh, one of the examples I saw one time was like yellow, uh, uh, yellow banana tires, like some people are like yellow banana tires, it has nothing to do with you would think yellow banana, what does that have to do with tires, but it was something that was so out there and non descriptive that clearly no one has yellow banana tires. So it was like the name of their business and the logo was this funny banana thing. And I remember seeing that somewhere, an article or something, and it was an interesting thing because I thought that is so bizarre, but yet it's acceptable because there's no confusion. There's yeah. really only one yellow banana tires. And so like yeah. no one's going to really get confused about that to where if you have, you know, like example, like bell tire or discount tire, like everybody kind of knows what those things are. And it's kind of obvious. But mm -hmm. um, so so that seems to be interesting. So let's talk about for a second in use versus intent to use, because I know this can also give people some snafus because it's called, you know, the cart before the horse or the chicken or the egg kind of thing. It's like, which one, how do I invest and use something and then file or, you know, the, the right and proper order of things and the likelihood of it getting approved um, using versus intending to use. Okay. Um, so this, uh, this comes with a little bit of risk. It depends on how you want to go about it. So uh, the, the key thing to know is that with the USPTO registration process, the USPTO does not allow your trademark to become registered until you are actually using it to sell your products or services, be that before you submit your application or sometime after your application has been submitted. So uh, it's not like a domain name. You can't just file a trademark and then hold on to it and decide to use it at some you know, point five years down the road. You have to show proof of use before they allow registration. So um, as you were alluding to, there are two types of applications. One of them is intent to use. All that means is I'm not using my product or I'm not using my trademark on my products and making them available for sale on the date that I submit my application but I plan on doing so before my, my trademark registers. Use in commerce means exactly what it means. I am currently on the date that I submit my application using my trademark to actively sell and promote and market my products or services. The risks associated with the two of them, use in commerce, if, if you file and you've already started selling your products and you haven't gotten trademark protection, there is a chance that your mark could be refused by the USPTO and not get trademark protection. What that would mean for you is then you don't have protection at the federal level and you would not be able to as strongly enforce your trademark, prevent other people from copying it, things of that nature. Um, if you are very careful before you start your name, before you start your business, choose your name. If you have a search performed, if you, uh, you know, get the domain name, the social media handles, all of those things, and really try to lock down uh, kind of your space in the digital era, then that's, you know, a, that's a risk that you have to be comfortable taking. Uh, if you do your due diligence, you should have a good understanding of, of what potential issues you might run into before you get into the registration process. 
so that you can feel comfortable moving forward with selling your products or services before you register. Uh, if you're risk averse, filing an intent to use ensures that you get the trademark before you spend any money doing branding and marketing and, and labels and all of those types of things. Uh, what that does for you though, is it might require that you try a couple of times. Um, so you might file two or you know one or two applications. The application process currently takes nine to 12 months. So it might be six months before you find out that you're able to start using the name or not use the name. And then you might have to start the process all over again. So uh, it, it, do you risk rebranding after you've already started selling or do you risk not selling and wasting that time when you could have been selling if your mark goes through? It's really, it's kind of which, which risks do you prefer? be kind of a low risk as well because the investment is not huge up front if you're just snagging a name even if you get a logo that somebody you know makes for you on fiverr and you start putting a little bit of it on custom packaging you know plus your application you're you're looking at less than a thousand dollars of an investment if yeah. you choose to kind of start there i have my, my personal experience has been in use is way better because they see it they see you have a presence there's not confusion with other marks and they're like yeah this person clearly owns this presence of this name or brand and it's it's enough out there to where you have the social media handles you have the domain you have a logo you you have printed materials that you're using um that certainly yep. seems to have helped our cause at least um yeah, with the and, things that we filed and and if you're uh, as you said if, if you're comfortable taking a couple of those steps you know getting the website going or uh getting the packaging then proving use isn't very difficult to do. Uh, it just comes with that kind of initial investment risk. Um, so it, it's it's one way or the other. The trademark costs, you're gonna incur those no matter what, if you do intent to use or use in commerce. So that's kind of a wash. It's more of, um, do you wanna make the initial investment up front and then take advantage of that time period while it's sitting in the application period? Or do you wanna hold off on the initial investment and potentially not get the gains from that you know, six months of sales or whatever you could be doing. Perfect. Okay, let's talk specimens because that's always something that trips people up um, when it comes to specimen. We'll we'll clarify that with it being they want images or pictures or something that you are you if you are using it and you say you're using it, they want to see it in use. Um, and so, what what are some appropriate uh, or best practices when it comes to submitting your specimen? Because that has to go with the application. Am I right? If you do a use in commerce, you have to show proof of use when you submit your application. If you do intent to use, you have to submit that proof later in the process, but you still have to submit it before your mark registers. So uh, it, that's a great question and it is a really um, uh, troublesome thing for, for some people to, to, to nail down because the USPTO is um, somewhat difficult to gauge in some of these. Um, so I, I would tell you this in terms of some guidance as to developing your specimens. For any, anyone creating a specific product, if you are creating um, uh, your own personal branded product, whatever it may be, I know shampoos or clothing or, or whatever it is, you want to take a picture of your mark on the product itself. And then you want to make sure that it is used in a what they call a trademark fashion. And I say that in, in more in regards to clothing. If you just splash your mark across the front of your t-shirt, that's what they call ornamental design and it does not qualify for trademark usage. When they're looking at clothing, they wanna see your brand name on the tag, be that the back of the shirt or in some cases a hanging tag, you know, whatever it is, they wanna see your brand on the tag itself. That is the best evidence you can supply. For other things, if you are advertising yourself as a service, so like an online retail store selling third-party products, if you are selling other people's products and you're doing it with your own storefront, either your own website or like a Shopify storefront or an Amazon storefront, you wanna have a, a screenshot of that storefront with your mark, clearly showing your page where people can purchase products. So a listing of your products or catalog 
or a picture of an actual product page that has the add to cart button. As part of that, you want to make sure you include visibly the website, the actual URL. You also want to have your clock of open and, a, and a clearly visible so that you can show the date and the time that you took that screenshot. If you fail to do any of those things, they will reject your specimen and request a new one. And for specimens, if you submit a use in commerce, your specimen has to be available in commerce on the day you submit your application. So if, for example, you tried to register a service and you didn't on your website have a clear understanding of what your service is. So say I'm a plumbing service, Acme Plumbing Services. Uh, and I just have on there uh, a picture, my, my logo and a, a little thing that says contact me, but I don't anywhere on my website talk about my service. USPTO is going to reject it and say, we see your mark, but we don't understand what the connection is to your services. So this isn't a good specimen. If I then go and update my website at that point, you know, six months after I submitted my application, that is not an, an accurate depiction of my services as they were being promoted on the day I submitted my application. And that is unacceptable. They will invalidate your trademark and you'll have to start the whole process all over again. Um, so for those of you, most of us, and most of the people listening are looking at bundling. Um, if you're actually doing bundles of your own branded products, your best bet is going to be get your brand name on those actual products, take a picture of it, take a picture of your Amazon store where it's available for sale, uh, take a picture of your social media, you know, if you have your own website, whatever, promoting your products, kind of hit them over the head with everything you can come up with so that they have as little chance of finding um, issue as possible. And just make sure that you're providing uh, for any digital content, you want to provide the date it was uh, obtained and the location of, of where it was obtained, the, the URL or whatever it may be. That's great advice. You know, that that's something that's super helpful because, um, you know, I, I keep talking to people about their custom packaging and everyone's like, well, what comes first, what comes second? I was like, well, honestly, the process, I feel like the steps are kind of like this. So like you know, going through the process is creating some sort of brand or logo, making sure it's not taken by someone else first, even before you file Correct. and deciding if you want a logo or just a word mark, having something, uh, even a custom packaging, a poly bag, a, stickers um even like my sticky notes that i have you know mommy income on right here you know yeah. those are really inexpensive but that also proves use in commerce because i have my logo on it as a physical entity and if i list it for sale somewhere even on a shopify store even on you know amazon um wherever then people can see that that's literally a product with this mark on it that Correct. is for sale in commerce. So a lot of people are scared of the whole, like I said, upfront investment, but these things don't have to be expensive. You just have to um, get creative about what you're offering and making sure it lines up with what you told the USPTO that you're selling. Yes. I mean, if you're, if you're telling them you're applying for apparel or clothing, and then you show them sticky notes with your word mark on it, that clearly is going to probably cause some problems. Am I right? <laughs> Yes, unless your sticky notes has something like uh, mommy income clothing and it's seen as a promotional item. Uh, but yeah, in most cases, that, that would be the case. So, so making sure that whatever category you're filing in for your trademark, because un, unlike what some people have assumed, this is another question we got via email was, um, does my is my trademark covered in all categories and i'm like well no because it, you don't file in all classes or categories for the uspto then you're then you're not well you're only protected for the classes you register for so for example Correct. mommy income is registered in a couple of services and a couple of products but if i were to make a t-shirt with mommy income that would not be protected because i did not file in the class of apparel so um Correct. You know, everyone, you can go make mommy income t-shirts and send me one because it's not protected by my my trademark at this point um, because I don't really make, I mean, I have made t-shirts, but that that sort of thing. It's more like digital services. So um, that that's a good clarification right there just to make sure. So the specimens, and they want to see um, not mock-ups. They want to see actual Correct. product with your mark printed on it. 
Correct. So if you're going to do packaging, you can't send them a PDF of what you would send to your printer. They want to see an actual bag, a box, uh, you know, a, a tag that you're throwing in there or a business card, whatever it may be. If you're handing out flyers, it just take, take the extra time, print off a couple of them, show that they are physical things that can be handed out and, and do that. Don't just send in a PDF. This qualifies Correct. for our for our particular listeners who are not watching the YouTube video. I'm just showing a poly bag that has mommy income brand on it. It is literally a physical thing. This is part of packaging. Now, another question people ask was, that, does the packaging have to be retail ready in order to be accepted? Because clearly this is not really retail ready. It has a brand and it has the brand I filed for, but there's no other information. There's not a UPC. There's not a manufactured by, because clearly this is just a bag. The product inside is what we're, we're protecting. Mm -hmm. um, but is this qualify as a specimen, even though it's just the packaging or does it have to be um, somewhere on the actual products? For example, like we talked about the whole Nike thing or the chocolates or whatever. So the, we're not actually branding the items in the bundle. It's the mm -hmm. actual bundle concept in general. So if you're doing a gift basket, then um, the packaging would be the branded product, not the things inside. Correct. Yeah. And, and uh, for a little bit of clarification, just slapping a, a mailing address or a UPS thing showing your, your name on it on an envelope doesn't qualify as packaging. They want to see what you were showing. This is my branded physical thing, which when, uh, when somebody opens the UPS bag or box, they're going to pull out this bag and it's going to say mommy income. And then whatever the, the products inside are, they could be yours. They could be third party products, you know, depending on what the, what the purchase was. Uh, but that, that bag is, is a, a very good example. They want to see the actual physical packaging showing your mark on it. Uh, you don't have to show that it has, you know, I've got all the Nike stuff in in my bag. No, they don't necessarily care about that. They just want to see the packaging itself. Awesome. Good to know. Um, certain things to avoid when filing your trademark or considering filing it ahead of time before after. What are things that we should not be doing? Uh, in, in in addition to the names um, that we talked about earlier, don't use generic names. Don't use just your last name. Try to avoid descriptive uh, words. Um, don't try to uh, be coy and, and make a play off of a competitor's name. You know, really go find a unique mark that, that allows you to stand out in the marketplace. Um, make sure that your mark is available. Uh, the worst thing you can do is decide on a, a name and then go through the process, both the investment for you know, getting your, your brand up and running and the trademark process, and then getting hit with uh, a cease and desist from somebody who already owns that name. Because uh, if you are deemed to be infringing upon somebody else's mark, they can take all of your profits. It doesn't matter if you've been doing it for five years and they haven't come after you. If you are infringing upon their trademark, they can take everything you've gotten from it. So uh, under no circumstances, just grab and go do some due diligence, do some research, um, really, really try to make sure that you have a, a clear name before you start investing any money in, in any part of it. Um, don't assume it's going to go easily. Um, <laughs> the, the trademark process Sells is... on Amazon to just assume that about everything right now. <laughs> it's not going to go the way you expect it to. So put, put on your big girl pants because it's going to be a while. Uh, yeah, for sure. That's great advice. It's it's there's nothing hardly anything that goes without a hiccup at some point. They're going to contact you. There's going to be some sort of something. So just kind of be ready, right? Yeah, and and this goes for both if you're doing it yourself or if you're working with an attorney. Um, obviously, if you're working with an attorney, they will do everything within their power to give you the best advice to get you the best chance at getting registered. However, it's not up to me. It's up to the examining attorney. Uh, I can make all the arguments that I think are right and, and um, I, I can do everything within my power and your mark could still get refused. So really just kind of go at it with an understanding of do everything you can to make sure that you have, you know, crossed your T's, dotted your I's and, and then kind of hang on for the ride. Um, 
I would I would venture it's not it's not a personal when somebody tells you eh, this isn't this isn't the best chance. Um, right. Just just take it for what it is because that uh, that's your attorney trying to give you some some helpful information in terms of whether or not your mark will get registered. Um, and then and then finally make sure you're you're dotting your i's and crossing your t's when you're going through the application. Uh, if you're doing it yourself, double triple check. Don't just do it one time, hit submit and pay your fee. Um, save it, think on it for a minute. Have I provided everything I can? If you have questions, ask. You know, you could start the process, you could uh, pay a site to do a search for you and then look at the report. And if you feel you're good, you can start the process. If you get to a point where you're starting to have misgivings, stop and talk to somebody because it is an investment and the worst thing you can do is put all the time and effort and money into it and then have it go nowhere. So, um, you know, the, the risk averse people, you don't want to spend the extra money you don't want to, and, and I get that. And, and I'm not just trying to make a pitch for attorneys. Uh, I'm not trying to, to, to goad people into that. I'm just trying to make sure that you understand um, it's, it's not an easy process. So if you have questions, if you don't think that something looks right, your best bet is to, to ask a question and, and try to get somebody on the phone. Um, you can always actually call the USPTO. They, they will answer and, and help where they can. They're obviously not going to give you legal advice. They can't tell you your mark has a good chance of registering. They're not going to do that. But if you have a question about what does this mean on the application, call them and ask, and, and they can help you with that. Uh, that's kind of what they're there for. So uh, don't be afraid to ask. Make sure that you give yourself the best chance of moving forward. For sure. Yeah. Ask those questions, you guys. None of us are experts at everything. And so we turn to experts to be doing that stuff. That's why I'm like, I got Ben on speed dial over here. Like, <laughs> all right, we've got this problem here. Um, no, seriously, though, um, one of the greatest things about um, these different things is that we don't have to be an expert at everything. I'm expert at creating products and putting them into the marketplace, but trademarks are not my thing. But talking about the protection for a moment, um, we've had we did have some questions come in about the enforcement of said trademark. So if you feel and this is kind of Amazon specific, so you can use broad or you know general explanations of this if if it applies. Okay. But um, people are like, well, now I have this trademark, but now somebody is uh, listing my product, or they're on my product, or they're listing something that's similar, or they you think that they're you're they're infringing upon your trademark. What what do you do about it? So there are a couple of things. Um, the first one is to note, once you have a trademark, it is your responsibility to police the trademark. The USPTO will not do that for you. If you are not enforcing your trademark, you can lose it. They can deem that you are not um, the sole owner of that trademark any longer. And so you do have to take active measures to make sure that the trademark is yours and you are the source of the, of the trademark because uh, as we discussed earlier, that's the sole purpose of a trademark. Be a source identifier for a product or a service. Let customers know who is making or providing the product or service. So uh, you have a couple of options. If you become aware that somebody is using your brand either on Amazon or elsewhere, you can obviously go to the, uh, the specific site, Amazon, or the social media platform where somebody has taken your, your name or is using your name or something of that nature. And you can tell them, I have a registered mark. The uh, individual is not licensed to use that mark. Remove their product listing, uh, post, account, whatever it may be. Um, I, I don't do that actively, so I can't walk you through specific steps, but that is one option. Uh, the second thing you could do, you could work with an attorney to send them what is called a cease and desist letter. So you figure out whoever the owner is, you find their address, the attorney sends them a wonderful letter that says, I own this mark, stop using it or else. If they continue using it, you have to follow through. Mm -hmm. You have to do the or else, um, or else you're not actively protecting your mark. And so uh, it, you could subject yourself to issues either these people really screw up and you get dinged because people think it's your problem or you uh, allow it to continue and somebody invalidates your trademark for not being a valid trademark anymore. Fair um, enough. Yeah, that's that, that we've all, I think a lot of us have received these cease and desist for listing products on Amazon that then brand owners don't want you to list. Although it's perfectly legal to list a, 
you know, like you said, fair use, fair trade, fair, um, um, fair use. Yeah, fair use of that product to where I can buy something off of a Walmart shelf and decide I don't want that, but I can sell that exact same product in its original form or in a bundle someplace else. That is your right as a consumer to do what you want with it. Um, but not like you said, I can't put the Nike logo on my mommy income shirt and then call it Nike made mommy. It's it's almost like you're saying they they're sponsoring something that's yours, which they're yes. not, right? So you can't you can't use their their things like that. But but um, we just recently got someone in mommy income community got a, a really big cease and desist from a very large brand, and she of course panicked and freaked out and thought I better take down all my listings. But essentially, she wasn't doing anything wrong. She was just listing or reselling one of the pieces of this brand. And Amazon has not yet restricted that brand on Amazon. So I said, that was a threat from the company, but I'm not sure that they can do anything about it because you're not misusing their trademark. You're simply reselling their product. Um, so what's the difference between, so say I find someone out there and they've got a mommy income course and they've called their website mommy income course instead of just mommy income and they look very similar to me and I say cease and desist um, and they're like, well, this is not the same, so it doesn't matter. Like what, what are your rights if so you really see somebody trying to copy your trademark? Uh, so the trademark is yours to use and license and disseminate for your listed products and services. So if it is somebody using your mark or something very similar to your mark, uh, again, it doesn't have to be the exact thing or, or the exact misspelling. So if they did income mommy course, that would be similar enough that you would have um, a valid claim that it is um, infringing upon your trademark and, and thereby harming your trademark rights. Um, so if somebody is doing that, then uh, you have the full weight of the legal system backing you to take action and and prevent them from coming from continuing to use that uh, so you send the cease and desist uh, if they if they don't uh, stop doing whatever that thing is offering the products or services then you you employ a lawyer to initiate a, a trademark infringement suit against them if they are willing to fight you if they want to put in the time effort and money to fight you on it then you would have if you have a registered trademark you have a very solid uh, uh argument that they are wrong and as i said earlier you can go after them for profits you can go after them for uh, for damages to your reputation um, you you can really hit them where it hurts um, so most people aren't going to continue doing after either the threat of the lawsuit or uh, obviously if you get into an actual lawsuit itself. That being said, uh, larger brands, they will, they will come after you. Um, I, I just, one of my, one of my colleagues the other day, uh, she was uh, filing a trademark for a, a company called McRoof. That is a very small family owned roofing business in Oklahoma and McDonald's came after them and is going to sue them if they don't stop using that name because it is Mick something. So uh, it, whether or not it is a valid claim, I, I can't say, but McDonald's is gonna take it the length to ensure that they are protecting their mark. So um, I would be cautious when, uh, when dealing with, with the products and, and services of, of larger brands because they are more invested and more likely to uh, be aggressive in their measures. And if you don't have the funds to, to fight, even if you think you're in the right, then realistically, it doesn't matter who's right because they're going to go the distance and, and you can't. So um, protect yeah, yourself. The ones with the deepest pockets usually win. So <laughs> uh, unfortunately, <laughs> yes. They can, they can tie you up with paperwork for the rest of your life. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, well, that's good to know. Uh, I had one other question and now I'm drawing a blank for a moment. Um, I don't know. I, I'm drawing a blank here when it comes to, to, to thinking about that, um, when it comes to the um, not just the filing, the enforcing, but then, um, you know, using it in in commerce and making sure that no one else is infringing. But then you talked about licensing. So at that point, if someone comes to you and says, oh, yeah, I don't remember what I was going to say. Um, so with the licensing, you could if someone was 
potentially infringing upon your license. You could offer them to purchase a use of your license and you give them Correct. permission then to like uh, Disney licenses um, betting to certain companies where you could use their logos and their their brands and things like yep. that. Um, so licensing or like NFL or anything like that can you can purchase or get in contract with them to license their logos for your products. Correct. Um, so yep. those are those are different fair ways to use people's trademarks in a way that's approved. Correct. Yeah. And, and as part of your, so what typically happens in the events of a cease and desist or something like that, your attorneys will, um, will engage in some kind of negotiation. So if you think you have a valid use or your mark is not that similar or whatever it may be, you could get into a negotiation. And uh, I've done a couple of these of myself where basically you end up saying, okay, my client agrees to limit their product offerings to XYZ. They will under no circumstances use the mark in connection with these products, which are yours. And they will uh, uh, make sure that they remove any potentially confusing products from their product lines immediately. So there are some kind of workarounds that, that you can get into. The licensing obviously would be a very, very good one if these people were dead set on no, we want to, uh, we, you got, you got great products. You got great services. You know, like we, we want to be you. Okay. Then a license is, is the way to go. And, and then that way you are getting the uh, recognition, but you're also able to hold them to a standard that your consumers have come to expect. And that's kind of the most important thing. You got to protect your brand, your goodwill, your reputation. Well, yeah, the, the one thing I was going to let everybody know is to in order to monitor your own trademark or to your, at least rem, uh, monitor the use, go to uh, google.com slash alerts and you can set up a Google alert for pretty much any phrase, anything that's ever used online. So, for example, I have all of my trademarks on Google alerts along with my own name so that anytime Kristen Ostrander is typed into or is put out into the internet, whether it's an article, a podcast, um, uh, this is how I found out people were stealing my courses and putting them on other sites for, you know, a couple of dollars a piece just to try to get this monthly membership. Um, they definitely got a cease and desist, but um, I, I, in order to monitor that, it's my responsibility. So I put out Google alerts where anytime those words or that phrase um, is used in the internet, I can monitor that and then decide whether it was something I submitted or if somebody was using that name in a in an inappropriate way um, that mm -hmm. I can then go after them for. So um, you can set up Google Alerts, that's free. And if you have a trademark already and just want to make sure that no one else is using it, even to list on Amazon, um, that's a definite way that you can easily uh, monitor your name and or mark without um, causing any issues. And at that point, you can pursue um, whatever might be next if someone's using it appropriately or maybe they're not maybe they're just happy they bought your product so who knows <laughs> yeah definitely and that like i said that's a good cheap easy way to to capture 99 percent of what's out there on the internet um, if you wanted a, a a specific monitoring system for registrations they there are a lot of different companies that offer those for an annual fee they'll send you a report um, weekly or monthly you know whatever your setup is um, or uh, you could work with a firm. I, I know that that's a product offering that we're looking at here in, in the very near future. So um, any of those options are, are very good, good for helping you do what you, what you need to do without having to expend a lot of energy doing so. Well, Ben, thank you so much for your time. I'm the second time around coming back here and answering all these questions. And it's great. Um, we will put all of the links for them to get a hold of you and your team. In the show notes, they'll also be, um, you know, we'll, we'll put them on our social media and everything else when the episode airs so that everyone can see uh, how to get a hold of you and start these services because trademarks are the best. It just, it makes you kind of sit back and just take a deep breath and be like, okay, I have, I am official. I, I, I am no. I've trademarked. And, and there's something to be said about that because it's just another thing to add to your, your, 
assets of your business um, when you go to either sell or perhaps you're trying to get a loan and they want to know the value of your business having a trademark is that investment that kind of shows your credibility that you're serious that you take your brand and your business seriously even if it's your your amazon side hustle it's still yep. an important thing to protect so again thank you so much for coming here and um Appreciate that you guys every I know you could be anywhere else listening to any other person any other time I don't take that for granted. Thank you for listening to the Amazon files podcast and we'll see you same time same place next week on the Amazon files. Thanks Kristen.